we invite to the stage now radiation oncology, Dr. Kartik Manny. Please. How are you? How are you? So you are double impressive. <laughs> Not only are you an MD, you're a PhD. <laughs> Now, uh, I can't imagine. So Radiation Oncologist, Department of Ray Radonc uh, at the Stony Brook Cancer Center, Clinical Assistant Professor, Renaissance School of Medicine at Stony Brook University. So Dr. Manny, tell us what you do. You know, give us a scope of radiation oncology in general, and then we'll dive into some specifics, if you will. That's great. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you guys all for coming. Um, it's a great event and forum. <clears throat> Um, so, yes, I'm a radiation oncologist, um, not a radiologist. Um, you'll hear from those people a little later. Um, they're fantastic also. Um, but my field is uh, very unique and um, specialized, and we use radiation to treat cancer. Um, and because uh, that's a very broad-ranging topic, I'll go into a little spiel about a little bit of background, and then we'll get into some, uh, some specifics. So, um, you know, the most basic thing you can ask is, what is radiation? Um, and when I say that, most people think of the Incredible Hulk or the, uh, the HBO miniseries Chernobyl. Anybody see that? Yeah? Yeah, it was a good show, I have to admit. Um, didn't do me any favors, but, um, <laughs> you know. Um, but, uh, you know, radiation can be a scary word to the public because we hear about it when bad stuff happens. Um, but, um, you know, it, it uh, kind of... Um, hides behind the curtain where it's been this incredible medical tool. And um, you know, fun fact, even to other physicians who don't have a lot of interaction with us, um, you know, they don't know a lot about radiation, so there's a little bit of, of fear and uh, anxiety with them referring patients. Um, you know, um, that's why one of the reasons Stony Brook is great is because we're also collegial. We discuss all the patients together in Tumor Board. All the physicians that you meet today, they work very closely with us. They know a lot about what we do, so um, that's one of the advantages of being in a big academic uh, center like this. But, um, but uh, you know, so back to that basic question, what is radiation? Um, it's just energy that's traveling through a medium. Um, it can really be light waves. So anytime you're outside, you're getting radiation on a cross-country flight when you use your cell phone. Um, so these are all simple forms of radiation, um, but not the same one that I use in my clinic um, or that's shown on HBO. Um, so um, that type of radiation is much higher energy. Um, so when light is at that frequency, we call it X-rays or gamma rays. Um, and that's uh, the most common way that patients are treated with radiation. We make x-rays with a machine and we point it um, at, at a target, which is the tumor or maybe an area where a tumor was. Um, there are a few other ways that we can deliver radiation. Um, one is called charged particles. Um, you guys may have heard of something called electron therapy or maybe even proton therapy. That's a newer one. Um, those are where we are taking those tiny little charged particles and shooting them, again, in a very precise way. Um, and there's uh, even more ways that we can deliver radiation. Um, you guys may have known people with thyroid cancer. It's pretty common on the island, and uh, they often have surgery. And then they'll say, oh, I went and got this radiation pill. So that's a, a drug that goes into your system, and it's sort of like a, a Trojan horse that gets into thyroid cancer cells that are left behind because they like iodine, and this is a radioactive form of iodine. Um, and the last way that we can deliver radiation is with something called brachytherapy. Um, and that's actually... Um, an invasive technique, almost everything else is non-invasive, but this is where we're um, putting radiation very close to where the tumor is. That can be with a catheter that we put in the tumor with our surgeons in the OR. That can be something we lay over the skin for, a, for like a mold and we're treating a skin cancer um, and delivers very, very precise radiation to that just that small area with very close fall off after. So um, that's kind of the spiel about you know, what radiation is. Um, and, um, and how we deliver it. But um, I do want to spend a few minutes talking about some of the technological innovations because um, you know, a lot of that fear and anxiety comes from knowing about radiation 20 years ago. You, know, you had someone, you knew someone that got you know, six weeks of breast radiation and they went through a lot. They had got radiation for a tonsil cancer. They had a really hard time. Um, so you know, um, in the old days, <laughs> um, this is now, I guess, like 30 years ago, um, we were 
able to make this type of radiation, but we couldn't really see the body very well. So we had x-rays, right? So the way you would deliver radiation is we take an x-ray and we'd say, I think the tumor is kind of in this location here, and I draw a box. And we'd point the radiation at the box, and so I call this affectionately the shoot the box method. Uh, and there'd be one field coming from the top or from the bottom or from the front to back. Um, very simple setup. Um, and believe it or not, this worked really well, but you can imagine if you can't really see exactly where you're targeting, there's a lot of collateral effects. The radiation goes to places it shouldn't go. Even still, that basic, basic paradigm established radiation as, as a pillar of cancer therapy. So all the old studies that sort of integrated radiation into these treatment paradigms came for those old techniques. So I'd love to tell you about what we have now because it's sort of generations different. So first, uh, we figured out that we can point the beams from different directions. And then we added attachments to the machine. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have said this. The machine is called the linear accelerator um, that we use to make radiation here at Stony Brook. Um, you may have also heard of branded versions of these, like CyberKnife. Um, uh, they advertise more heavily than we do. But um, it's all the same, same technology to make x-rays. Uh, there is also another type of platform called Gamma Knife, which uses um, a radioactive uh, element called cobalt in a machine to make x-rays. Uh, at the end, all of them are making x-rays and pointing them at a certain, certain location. So, um, so back to the machine, we can put something in front of it with these tiny little metal slits. They're about a few millimeters wide. And they can move in and out of the field at any point, and they can sort of shape the beam. So from that really old school approach, we became, OK, instead of shoot the box, I'm going to shoot the circle, or I'm going to shoot the triangle, or so I'm going to shoot this type of shape. And I'm going to do it from, instead of one or two beams, I'm going to use five or six. And that became known as 3D conformal radiation therapy. Um, but then we didn't stop there, because um, you know, the, uh, even using the computing power of 20, 30 years ago, which uh, is not even as powerful as your cell phone, um, we started modeling some of these treatments with nice you know, CAT scans with 3D images. So now we knew exactly where the tumor was. And we could point the beam then from any direction. And a computer could optimize actually where those little slits are coming in. Wow. So this became known as uh, adjusting the fluence of the beam or adjusting the intensity. And that, uh, you may have heard this term, as intensity modulated radiation therapy, or IMRT. So that's where we can kind of deliver beams from anywhere. We can change the, in, the, uh, the intensity or the density of those photons that are coming out. And in doing so, the purpose of all of this is to make the treatment more precise. So before we had that box, you had that big area around the tumor. You couldn't really know where you were. Now you're narrowing it down. And currently, we have millimeter level accuracy for what we want to treat. So if I plan to treat it, I can put the dose that I want within a few millimeters of where I'm going. Sometimes even one millimeter, sometimes exactly where I want. Depends on where, what the setup is. So um, all of this um, led us to be a little more confident in our treatment delivery. And we began experimenting with ways to actually deliver more dose. You know, Because when we were not very precise, we didn't want to deliver too much dose because that would create too many side effects. So um, but we said, now, OK, now I have millimeter level accuracy. Why don't I sort of? turn up the power a little bit, why don't I put more dose in the tumor and less dose everywhere else? And this became known as stereotactic radiosurgery, um, or SRS. When we use that in the brain, um, it's called SRS. When we use it in the body, it's called stereotactic body radiation therapy, or SBRT. This has other fancy names like Sabre, which leads clinical trials people to make fancy names like Sabre Tooth and Lightsaber for the, for the names of the studies. But, um, but um, it's all the same, same idea, that you're using this incredible precision to deliver dose um, that you know, we couldn't even imagine of 30 years ago. Um, and Stony Brook, we do this very, very frequently. We're very adept at this technology. Um, even some of our faculty were the pioneers in using this in certain areas of the body, like the spine. Um, and so, you know, what did that do for us? Well, um, you know, we, we think of all treatments in terms of a therapeutic ratio. How much benefit are you getting versus how many side effects? So we, with these, all these innovations, we pushed this envelope farther and farther away. We're getting huge benefit because we're getting so much dose in, in the target, and we're, we're uh, having the dose fall off so quickly that the neighboring tissues are spared. So that therapeutic ratio has been going up and up and up. And where we've ended up now is with these techniques, IMRT, SRS, SBRT, is that we can deliver ablative dose, meaning dose that controls the tumor in 90, 90 plus percent of, of the time, um, to anywhere in the body. 
Um, and that is an incredible achievement. Um, so um, circling back to you know, what I said before about some you know, unknowns and anxiety about radiation, um, modern radiation is not your granddaddy's radiation. It is totally, totally different paradigm. Um, I would um, you know, provocatively say also that we are encroaching into, into new areas with this. Um, we're treating a lot of cancers definitively with radiation. Early stage lung cancer can be cured with a week of radiation. Prostate cancer can be cured with a week of radiation. Brain mets in the brain, single shot radiation with a 90% control rate. Um, so these are, these are like totally different paradigms we're dealing with. And this is not to you know, encroach on my you know, surgical colleagues' uh, you know, um, space. You know, we're all collegial here. But um, it, it does really change the game in terms of, of what we can offer. Um, so um, that's kind of a 10-minute snapshot of the evolution <laughs> of radiation in 30 years. Um, but um, you know, we can take it from there. And I'd love to tell you even more about what we're doing here at Stony Brook. I feel like I'm on an episode of uh, Sheldon with the, the scientist, <laughs> whatever show that is. Um, your your brilliance is uh, is emanating <laughs> from you. But uh, so with your accuracy now of radiation oncology, there's no organ too big or small that you could reach. Now tell us about what organ systems have you personally worked on or are currently working on? What malignancies are you targeting right now in your work? Yeah, so my personal, uh, sorry, I just hit my mic. Um, my, uh, my, in my personal clinic, um, we, uh, I treat uh, a lot of head and neck cancer. Um, so that, that um, doesn't use as much radio surgery. We still use some of the older paradigms where we treat over a longer period, but with the same precision. Um, and we have a great setup here at Stony Brook where we um, actually, I run a clinic jointly with the surgeons. So it's all discussions with the patient jointly, all the risk benefits, nuances of all these different treatments. Um, this is really important when you have a situation where you could reasonably treat with radiation or treat with surgery. Better to have everybody in the same room having that discussion. Um, I also treat uh, a lot of lung cancer, sarcomas, which are tumors in the soft tissue. Um, and um, we have a pretty active uh, radio surgery program in the brain and spine, and I, um, I run some of those programs as well. Um, and then, you know, when we're on call in the, um, um, for our service, you know, it's kind of whatever walks through the door. So, sure. um, you know, I talked about some of the, you know, curative types of radiation and, and definitive types of treatment, but we also see a lot of um, patients with end-stage disease where they don't really have any option left, but we can certainly palliate them with radiation mm -hmm. to provide pain control, relief, even if they're, you know, destined for, uh, for hospice or comfort care, that provides a big benefit. So I'm not you know, sort of diminishing that side of it, but, um, but um, so we have sort of a good spectrum of um, very early stage curative, uh, advanced stage where we can combine with other modalities and late stage where we can provide palliation. We have that sort of whole, whole spectrum of offerings that we have. So you're literally, you could be involved in literally every phase of someone's journey. Right. Possibly. <laughs> yeah. And when you collaborate with the surgeons and you're speaking about a case that you could possibly radiate, they could possibly excise with surgery. How does that conversation go? And is it an overall weighing the risk and benefit? You talk about the therapeutic range and, and it's amazing how the, the, the benefits far outweigh the risk and they're getting further and further apart in your field. And so how does that conversation go with the, with the surgeon? Because surgeons want to operate, radonks want to radiate. <laughs> uh, you know, so tell us how that goes. You, uh, you hit the nail on the head. These are actually, um, I find these um, super fun because um, what's happened is you heard, you heard from some fantastic surgeons this morning about all the advancements and robotics and things like that. So all the great stuff I told you about, that the same thing's been happening there. Um, and also the same thing's been happening in medical oncology where they have new access to immunotherapy and drugs. Um, so um, there is a little bit of an, an unknown um, that we have, but uh, these conversations are um, here are always very collegial. Um, we discuss the patients in a tumor conference, we'll present the history, and you know the surgeon will chime in and say, yeah, this is a resectable case, and then me or my colleagues will chime in and be like, you know, radiation could be offered. And oftentimes, um, we, um, if it truly is like an equal, you know, we feel like there's some uh, equipoise, not always, you know. Sometimes we really think surgery's better and we'll send them over, and sometimes they say, no, I don't want to operate on this patient, send them to me. But sometimes if there is equipoise, we may even leave it to the, uh, to the patient and say, go meet with everybody, hear all the individual nuances and risks and benefits, because 
you know, patients will have their own uh, biases. You know, sometimes uh, patients, even despite whatever I tell them, will be very scared of radiation, say, Doc, I just want this thing cut out. That's just what I want, and that's going to be better for me. And honestly, that's, if that's going to provide both the clinical outcome and the peace of mind, we would absolutely support that. We're not going to be sort of, you know, grubbing for business here. But there may be patients that are also very scared of surgery, and this provides a very effective non-invasive option. I did want to kind of highlight that, that all these sort of wonderful things I'm talking about are still delivered non-invasively uh, most of the time, unless we're talking about very specialized uh, techniques. So um, it's, a, it's sort of a week or a few days of outpatient treatments coming in and out, um, which is very different from a hospital stay in, a, in an operating room. But again, you know, it all depends on the specific clinical circumstances and you know, the patient's wishes and desires, because ultimately we want to empower them to make the right mm. decision. You know? So you could deliver radiation to heal a tumor, to shrink a tumor, and possibly eradicate a tumor. Yes. Um, Non-invasively, mm -hmm. that a patient could come. And, and are there specific organs, obviously, that might be easier to work on because of their proximity to the skin? Uh, some organs that are buried, you know, maybe, you know, a gallbladder or a pancreas, or uh, certain organs could be more difficult to get to. Um, yeah, that's a fantastic question. So, um, you know, the um, position with the body or the size of the organ matters a little less than what it's near. Um, if it's near a critical structure like the spinal cord or the brainstem or the esophagus, you know, then we have to be, um, we have sort of very strict constraints about what we can deliver to that organ without causing injury beyond a certain level. Now, that makes the treatment a little more challenging. Mm. Not not uh, impossible, but we, you know, um, that, that's the issue. Um, a lot of times uh, uh, this question comes up is how big, uh, is a tumor too big for mm. radiation? And um, it, it really, again, is the same issue is that as long as we can get the dose in and, and spare everything else, you know, there's no sort of, we haven't hit sort of some maximum that says we can't treat beyond this level. Now, you know, you have to account for the fact that um, you, you can't radiate like half the liver, right? So if there's a 15 sure. centimeter lesion, we're not gonna recommend radiation to that. But, um, but those are the things we, um, we kind of think about. Now, in terms of uh, ease of, um, you know, a lot, of, um, a lot of SBRT is being used now in the lung. Um, so those are, you know, you know, on a relative scale, it's easier because those are big organs. Um, you know, there's two of them, so um, they're split into lobes, so there's some sort of um, regional distribution. If you, um, if you cause an infect in one lobe, it's, it's generally not gonna affect the other. Um, and, um, but, you know, the other, other problem with the lung and, and other organs of the body is that they move. So we, um, we actually do uh, some pretty sophisticated, um, we call it a 4D simulation, where we scan the patient while they're breathing or while they're, you know, so we can actually see exactly where the course of that wow. is. Because millimeter level accuracy is great, but if the tumor moves this way, then. <laughs> 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 so um, my first day as a resident when I was in training, my, um, my program director uh, asked me this question. He said, what's the first rule of radiation oncology? And I, on my first day, I'm like, oh, I don't know. Be nice to your patients. What are we, uh, what are we doing? And he said, no, no. First rule of radiation oncology is don't miss. So, <laughs> so however we can, we can shift the paradigm so we don't miss. So that usually involves getting new um, high resolution imaging um, with motion, mm. uh, MRIs for things that we can visualize in the, in the brain and spine where that has better resolution. Anything that can get us to see it better, you know, yeah. um, that's, 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 the, that's the name of the game. Um. So I feel like we could talk to you all day. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Dr. Sasson mentioned if uh, a tumor is removed, sometimes they still do a chemotherapy to make sure that uh, you know, cancerous cells, malignant cells that are not visible to the eye could still be uh, removed, eradicated from the chemo. Is there anything like that with radiation oncology? If a tumor's surgically excised, are you still going in after and attacking the area to make sure that it's eradicated? Absolutely, great question, 100%. So, um, you know, again, I said that we are, you know, we operate in, in concert with these other specialties. Um, adjuvant radiation is a very, very common paradigm. I think breast is the most common one where uh, 90, you know, some percent of the patients will get surgery first. Sometimes they get a little chemo up front, but they get surgery. And then based on risk factors, they may get radiation. Um, nearly all other disease sites have some paradigm like this. Uh, in fact, some of them uh, have the radiation up front. 
neoadjuvantly. Yeah. So that's true in a lot of GI cancers. Um, and um, and uh, you know the, the paradigms sometimes have shifted where first we used to give uh, radiation after surgery and now we give it before. Um, you heard about rectal cancer, but that's one area where we've moved the radiation up front. Um, there are um, you know, investigations now into different uh, paradigms where um, sometimes the radiation isn't even offered, but um, that's definitely one of those, uh, those settings. So we do have this, um, we can plug in, you know, in, in, both, uh, in both areas in, in, in the timeline. Sarcoma is another big uh, one where we can operate, uh, we can radiate after surgery or before. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility here, and again, it just depends on the case and yeah. you know, what the evidence is telling you. Yeah, you I could, apologize, my answers are all long-winded, but. No, they're, they're great. You could shrink a tumor prior to surgery, so the surgeon is less, could, could remove less tissue from the person's rectum, colon, wherever it is, and then that's overall more beneficial, obviously, to the patient. Yeah, so um, sometimes there is that, that uh, we call it a cytoreductive effect, where the tumor itself gets smaller, but the, the bigger advantage is really the sterilization of the neighboring area, right? Those microscopic disease, because yeah. they can take it out confidently knowing this, is, this has been treated, so there's no, you know, and then we can actually confirm that on pathology. Sometimes we get what's called a pathologic complete response, meaning that whatever we treat with upfront, chemo, radiation, or both, uh, when we actually do surgery, we don't see any tumor left. Wow. And so that's sort of, you know, that's, uh, that's a little bit of the, uh, of, uh, the holy grail there. But, yeah. um, and, then, um, and then perhaps, you know, even selecting, there's a, there's a set of patients where you, wouldn't, you could do less, right? You, you, you treat them so aggressively, you could do less. We don't always know who those patients are, but that's sure. sort of the, the thinking. So this is so exciting to see where medicine was and where medicine is, and who the heck knows where it's going <laughs> from here. But uh, we're blessed and thankful to have you and people like you in the field you're in because none of it would be possible without your, your passion and energy for it. Uh -huh. So we thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for sharing. Oh yeah. No, usually in prostate cancer, we don't, um, don't do both. Um, although sometimes uh, you do one or the other. So you're trying to cure it with one or the other. Sometimes um, when um, we find uh, something in the, if they go for surgery and we find something in the, in the pathology that, that makes us uh, a little bit concerned. Maybe there are lymph nodes involved that we didn't see before. Maybe there's extension outside the prostate. Then we would offer radiation on the, on the back end um, and uh, oftentimes with, with hormone therapy. Um, but we usually don't, um, we don't try to offer both, particularly in prostate cancer. Thank you for your Thank you all. attention. Thanks so much. Thank you, man. You're awesome. <laughs>